And I welcome our next speaker, uh, Michael Duren, prof professor of experimental physics at Gießen University and co-founder of the Desert Tech Foundation, which studies the use of solar and wind energy, and a fellow German. So um, we are talking about a source of energy which potentially could give us not a thousand years um, worth of energy, but energy forever. Now, that's the theory. What about the practice? Yeah, so I'm talking about having solar energy from Africa to light the room here, for example. Um, this, in a way, is a crazy idea. And the reason why we need that is because we have an extraordinary problem, which I would like to mention here. Um, we all know that we have an energy. We all know that we have an energy problem in the world. This has two reasons. One is because the population is rising fast, and the second is because everybody wants to have more energy than before. And if you look at the scale of the problem, you can learn something. At the moment, we have an energy consumption of about 16,000 gigawatts every moment and in future this will increase to about 24,000 gigawatts. I use the unit gigawatt here because it's easy to remember that one nuclear power plant is one gigawatt. So that means that at the moment if we would run for nuclear 100% we would need 16,000 nuclear power plants. And if you know the scale of this energy problem then uh, you might uh, be a little bit reluctant if you really want to have so many nuclear power plants. We want to reduce CO2 and that means that in the next 40 years we have to install 15,000 gigawatt of new capacities. If you go nuclear you have to build every day a nuclear power plant for 40 years. If you go with coal or with solar you have to do the same amount but in the different technology. So the, the size of the problem we have is really so extraordinary that we need new solutions. Therefore, in a way you can say Desert Tech wants to use natural nuclear fusion. Our fusion reactor exists already, it's our sun. We are at a safety distance of 150 billion kilometers. The sun is highly radioactive, you shouldn't come close to it. And the only thing we still have to build are solar dishes which catch the energy and make use of it. So what we need to solve the energy problem is a technology which is simple and safe and renewable so that it will last forever. Why do we in Desert Tech want to use the deserts? The reason is simple because in the deserts there is most of the solar energy. If you just use current technology you have about 20 times the solar energy in the deserts of the world which you need for the whole energy supply of the whole mankind. So this shows you that the um, potential of solar energy in the desert is immense. The technology is simple. This here is a picture taken last year in Egypt. It's a solar trough concentrating power generator. So the only thing you need is a parabolic mirror in this trough here. In the center you have a pipe where you heat up some liquid and this hot liquid goes to a standard power generator. It's the same technology as in nuclear power plants except that our nuclear reaction is on the sun and uh, the steam is generated here in this solar panels. This shows you the full picture of this um, device in Egypt so it works it can be done anywhere with simple technology and that is the technology where we believe we have to do it in, in huge numbers to solve the energy problem. One problem of the sun is that it doesn't shine at night. There's no way to change that and <laughs> we still want to have power at night. This here is a picture from Spain. You know people in Spain start to live when the sun went down. I don't know how it is in London here but probably similar, so you need electricity at night and the simple way to do it using this concentrated solar power stations is you store the heat, you don't store the electricity and you don't store the sunlight. The heat can be stored in a very simple way. Here it's done in these big tanks. You have one tank with a cold liquid which you heat up over the day. You store it in the second hot tank at 400 degrees Celsius about 
and then at night you need you use this hot liquid in this case here it's liquid salt uh, to produce steam which you then use to produce electricity how do you bring the electricity from the deserts to the people well this is simple nowadays when i started this uh, discussions some 20 years ago, the people were thinking of producing hydrogen and uh, shipping the hydrogen to Europe. Nowadays, it's very simple. You just need a cable, you need high voltage, and you need DC current. Normally, our electricity network is AC, alternating current. This AC current has a lot of losses. The reason, one reason is because you produce electrosmog you broadcast electromagnetic waves which, and there you lose energy. If you use DC, you don't need that, you don't have that anymore, and the power losses are less than 10% over 3,000 kilometers. Here's another picture from Spain. It's another type of solar power plant. It's a solar tower in the center with a lot of thousands of small mirrors around. Each of the mirrors is remote controlled and follows the movement of the sun. And the sun is focused at the center of this tower in the center. And there you have very high temperatures and high energy. And again, you use that to produce electricity. This is one option. We have the hope that in future you don't only produce electricity this way, but also you can produce liquid fuels. Uh, this is a technology which is already working in the lab. One process is you put, high, uh, you put water and CO2 in and sunlight, heat. Then you have a catalytic reaction and from that you produce alcohol and oxygen. So this works in principle but not on an industrial scale yet. There's another aspect of Desert Tech which we have to talk about and that are the geopolitical aspects of Desert Tech. Here in Europe, we have a special situation because our next <laughs> desert is in Africa and the people in Africa have a very different standard of living compared to us. And we know that there's a strong rise of population. The amount of water is going down. It will be going down faster in future because of the climate change. And there will be more people living in poverty and without food and water and this will of course produce not only problems in Africa but also in Europe and therefore we believe that for Europe of course it's important to have renewable energy but it's even more important to have a secure neighborhood. So Desert Tech aims to connect the continents Africa and Europe. We bring to Africa energy and industrialization. We can produce hundreds of thousands of jobs with this program and this gives new perspectives to the young generation there and that helps to stabilize our society on the long term. Here a plot which shows how it's realized or how one way of realization is. You have the solar power stations in North Africa, you have the centers of consumption in Europe, and the only thing you have to do is you have to have DC cables between Africa and Europe. Yeah, if you have a new house and you have in different rooms you need electricity, you also put cables to every room. That is the same in a larger scale here. And this way you produce a, a so-called supergrid, which has very low losses. This has the advantage you can get the power from Africa. But in addition, it has another advantage because here in Scotland you want to have offshore wind farms and we have it in Germany and in Denmark and in Morocco as well. And wind is fluctuating, but if you have a supergrid, you can put the electricity always there where you need it. So you can average out these fluctuations to big extent. If you look at costs, I'm finishing soon, if you look at costs, <laughs> it's about 8 cents per kilowatt hour which you uh, have to pay at the moment for the solar energy. Um, one example here, a British company called Tunur with Tunisian investors has a project to have a cable from Tunisia to Rome. By the way, today the ambassador, the British ambassador was in at the Prime Minister of Tunisia because of this project. And it's not only Britain, there's a big 
list of companies, the so-called Desertec Industrial Initiative. By the way, Shell is one of the associate members there as well. All these big companies want to earn money with the Desertec concept. So we have, we as the uh, Desertec Foundation have some hope that things are moving in future. So to conclude, Desertec solves four key problems. It's, it produces renewable and safe energy. It produces water by desalination for Africa. It produces hundreds of thousands of new jobs as well in Europe as in Africa. And it has peacekeeping incentives because it stabilizes the African region. Thank you. Well, from one German to another, it's true that, you know, um, anything at a time when our reputation in Europe is that we're throwing our weight around a little bit again, that smacks potentially of 21st century colonialism, will obviously raise some eyebrows, I would imagine. But sort of in terms of the moral question behind it, um, uh, or, or even, even a sort of self-interested question for Europe, are we really wise to yet again make ourselves dependent on a region that is, to say the least, um, politically unpredictable? Well, as I try to, to say, we see it the other way around. Uh, we think that it stabilizes politically, and we are anyway depending. About 80% of our primary energy comes from foreign countries, like the gas from Russia. <laughs> Who knows uh, to whom Russia will se uh, sell the gas in 20 years from now? There are other people who like to have gas. Mm. So we are anyway depending on different countries. And <coughs> by having the solar power from Africa, we have a diversification of these sources in a way. Right, questions again at the back. The gentleman over there. <coughs> Sorry, microphone's coming. Hi there. Um, this is connected to what you just said, which is essentially that uh, doesn't this just transfer the power currently held by Gazprom? Can you identif identify yourself? Just so oh, we sorry, know. Charles Oliver, Durham University. Thanks. Um, doesn't this just transfer the power currently held by Gazprom over the Eastern Bloc to Italy and Spain? They now have the transport rights to the power. Surely they would use that. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but isn't that quite a dangerous thing to hand all of your power connectivity to other powers? So I didn't quite get the, um, the question. The question was uh, if it's dangerous to be depending on these countries or... It's Both in terms of politics as well as in terms of transport links. If you're, consider if you're transporting something at 900,000 volts over 6,000 kilometers, yes. there's going to be a disruption at some point. Well, first of all, it's not one cable, it's like 20 cables, for example. Secondly, this technology is, uh, is used in China, for example, a lot nowadays, these high-voltage DC lines. So it's, it's not different than any other technology. We also have uh, pipelines from Russia to Europe, which are also dangerous. But precisely, or dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I guess that is partly the point, isn't it? That they are dangerous, and so the question is, can we make it safer? But maybe there is no alternative. But what, what should be the danger of a high-voltage cable? We have it everywhere here, so it's one more cable. I don't, I don't think it's, tech, it's politically, if anyone would be manipulating it or... Um, as I said, there are, uh, there are lots of cables, and um, we, we always, of course, have to have backup capacity. Mm -hmm. So if you have a coal power plant here in England, you shouldn't use it, but you can, in case of, of a political crisis or if, if there's some terroristic attack on the cable, you can switch on your coal power plant again for a month and repair the cable, and then you continue with solar energy. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. We'll have the gentleman here and the lady over there. Keep it really short, please. Uh, Martin Livermore from the Scientific Alliance. I, I should say that I, I think the idea of, of getting energy from the sun ultimately is an excellent one because that's where all the energy does come from. Um, but I think that what we're talking about here currently is, is probably the most expensive form of renewable energy. Certainly photovoltaics are, and I have no reason to suppose that thermal solar is, is any cheaper. If you then add on the the cost of the high voltage cables, which I, I understand, of course, are technically feasible. We're talking about a very complex, uh, very expensive system. This is a highly ambitious project, and I can't see that it's going to make a lot of difference within perhaps the next two decades or so. 
And in the meantime, there'll be other technologies coming along which would compete with it. Could we just have a microphone phone over to the lady over there? Just a few rows back. There we go. Hi, I'm Anna, Anna Hill, founder of Space Synapse Systems. Um, my question is in relation to economical, economic and political uh, cooperation and are the mechanisms that we have for the global energy shortages sufficient and what would your recommendations be? Okay, so the first question was on the price for renewable energies. Um, actually, it's cheaper to build a power plant in Africa and build a cable in addition than to try to do renewable energy in our countries. Yeah, so it pays off even if you go from the south of Spain to the north of Africa, you pay off the cable. The cable from Africa to Europe is about one cent per kilowatt hour. So it's not really significant. And um, the other question was on the econ economic... The, the p political economic cooperation, is that right? With Yes. This is. Yes, I, I think the socio-economical questions are the main problems in the whole project. Technology is mostly developed. The cables are developed. They are using it in China, but the difficulties, of course, is to get uh, some political frameworks which work. We are also in contact with China, for example. In China, it's much easier. They have their own deserts, they can build their power plants and their cables, and they have no political issues there. It's similar in the US, but Europe and Africa have the additional political problems. First of all, the European countries are, uh, it, it, it's a long way that they uh, find a common way in this issue. And then you have about 10 or 15 different countries in North Africa and Arabia, which are also, politically very difficult, different. So it, that is the main issue and that is what, our, what the Desert Tech Foundation tries to push, like we, we are building a Desert Tech University network now in North Africa and we have members from all African states in this network. But one also has to say you can start already bilateral, like this British company now between Tunisia and Italy, they just do it, they, they build the power plants, they build the cables and then it works. Mm. Between Britain and um, Algeria it would be more difficult because there are more countries in between and you have to somehow um, find ways on how much money does Switzerland get if they put a cable through their country and those issues, yeah. So it's, it's politically, it's a very difficult thing, economic, economically as well. But um, to me, it's, it's worth doing it because it's, it will be, uh, and I don't agree that it's the inexpensive way. In the long term, I believe it's the most cheapest way, except for offshore wind energy to do renewable energies. And it's somehow complementary to wind energy because the concentrated power stations can produce power on demand and then they can reduce the fluctuations. We will take a vote later, right at the end of the evening, on these five initiatives. So um, let, prepare yourselves mentally for which one you're going to vote for. Thank you very much. Um,